Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is proving to be one of the a very fascinating series on the Book of Revelation. You know, the Book of Revelation is a bit of a challenge to try to understand. In fact, I have a friend that says you can't understand the Book of Revelation unless you read it several times and then read it again. So we'll see what we can learn this time. This is lesson number nine in that series from March 2 of 2019 entitled Satan and His Allies. That should prove to be interesting. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we know that you have been in all-out war for so many millennia, and I'm sure you're looking forward to the end of this so much more than we ever possibly could be. We don't even understand all the issues. And yet, your patience holds on, waits for us. May that time not be extended too much longer is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, last week we talked about Revelation 12. And before you go on, you said in the introduction that one has to read this through several times to understand it. So what does that say for the people that read it first at the various churches? Well, they just heard it. Yeah, but I, I'm sure that, I mean, they weren't like getting new Bibles every week. I'm sure when they heard it the first time, they came, probably took a part of it, and then they came back and they say, you know, we've been thinking about that. What about, what about, what about, what about? I'm sure they spent plenty of time, and of course, they understood all the nuances that that were in John's mind when he wrote it, which we have to read and reread to sort of get it and more understanding in our, of our understanding of the Old Testament to, you know, and we're constantly, scholars are constantly discovering new nuances that pro were just probably automatically thought of by them. So, yeah. I, I, <coughs> If they grew up in the, the Jewish culture, then yeah. they, the references to the Old Testament. So. Someone has said that you can't understand Revelation without reading the Old Testament. Yeah, that's so. also true. Yeah. Well, we studied chapter 12 last week, and we, we discovered that chapter 12 is divided into three sections. In Revelation 12, 1 to 6, we talk about how Jesus came to this earth, the preparation for that, and how he came to this earth to, to resolve the problems that had arisen. In Revelation 12, 7 to 12, we, we hear about how it all started way back there in heaven, not on this earth, in heaven. And then in Revelation 12, 13 to 18, we talk about how that conflict will come to an end as a part of this earth's history. And of course, we'll be talking about an expansion of those last few verses for the rest of the book of Revelation. So in this lesson, we're going to focus particularly on um, the area of emphasis is the prophecy called the 1260 day or 42 month or three and a half year prophecy covering a period which we don't have time to go through the all the details of how we arrived at these dates but from 538 AD to 1798 AD the period of Roman and papal domination of the Western world during this time Satan will use or did use two allies which are called beasts and who unite to oppose God's activities in every way possible, and to delay what even Satan himself knows will be the final end and his destruction. So you can see this is a life and death matter for him. Maybe if it were a little bit more of a life and death matter for us, it would have been over before now, but we need to take this really seriously. Well, a word of precaution before we move on. We are now moving into the section of Revelation that talks about things that are still future in our day. And when we talk about things that are still future, does God spell everything out in detail? No. I see people shaking their heads. God gives us a few hints here and there, so that he, just enough so that we, when, when things happen, we'll know, oh yeah, Obviously, God knew what was coming. He understood it. He's still in control. We need to trust him. Ken, yeah. how did those first readers read that? I mean, we see things in that that really pertain to us today. 
I mean, they had no clue. And they had no clues about the, the things that we see in those passages, yeah. no. They, presumably they had ideas about what it meant in their day. But they were living, uh, this was uh, the seven churches we are looking at. So Ephesus, this would be what, about Smyrna by now? I, well, he, she's asking about the time when John actually wrote. Right. So okay. this would be about 90 to 100 90, okay. AD. Right. Yeah. There you are. So they were living through persecution. They, yeah. yeah, pretty severe persecution. At Very that point severe time. persecution. I mean, they, right. he tried to store, uh, Domitian tried to, to kill John, yeah. threw him and had him thrown in a pot of boiling oil. We already talked about that. Right. And the same people who put him in there had to pull him out when he didn't cook. You know, and, and, and then he said, oh, well, we'll take care of him. We'll send him off to the Isle of Patmos. And, what we're studying here is what we have. <laughs> the, the, the beauty is they lived it then, and we are also about to be living right now. Exactly. As the prophecies are unfolding right in front of us. So look at the, the words covering the previous time period. Revelation 13, 1 to 4, and verse 8. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On each of its horns there was a crown, on each of its heads there was a name that was insulting to God. The beast looked like a leopard with feet like a bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And then we're going to drop down to verse 8. All people living on earth will worship it, except those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. So who knows exactly what's coming in advance? Only God. God. Only God. Well, a, another reference out of the future we haven't gotten to yet, Revelation 17, 8, will help us to understand a little bit about this beast. That beast was once alive, but lives no longer. It is about to come up from the abyss and go off to be destroyed. The people living on earth whose names have not been written before the creation of the world in the Book of the Living will all be amazed as they look at the beast. It was once alive, now it no longer lives, but it will reappear. So what are we talking about here? Is someone trying <clears throat> to imitate somebody else? Well, the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. But it's not the, we're not talking about the, the Christ The dragon here. is trying to imitate Christ. The dragon is trying to imitate God. As much as possible, God's whole scenario. So we're going. That's one of the major things we're going to talk about in this lesson. Would counterfeit be a better word? Barbara? Counterfeit. Counterfeit a, is the right is a good word. Counterfeit Trinity, because you have Satan yeah. trying to right. take the place of God, and and uh, the beast from the sea trying to take the place of Christ, and the beast from the land bringing fire down. Uh, you know, imitating the Holy Spirit, so. Okay, well, beasts in the Bible, let's just a few, set a few ground rules here. The beasts in the Bible represent governments which emphasize their religion as a dominant characteristic. In other words, to have a beast, you have what? A combination of religious power and military, civil, authoritarian power as well. And of course, what, how does the devil want to use that power that's available to him? Persecute anybody who's not in line, right? Well, in Rebel, verses 3 and 4 that we just read, the devil himself is described. But he tries to hide behind a human organization with, which in its initial stages was pagan Rome. And Carrie, I think you have something about that. Yes. The line of prophecy in which these symbols are found begins with Revelation 12, with the dragon that sought to destroy Christ at his birth. The dragon is said to be Satan, and that comes from Revelation 12, verse 9. 
He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome, and that comes from the great controversy between Christ and Satan, page 438, paragraph 2. I want you to look at something very interesting as we're looking at those verses. Look at Revelation 12 um, and verse, I think it's 14. Um, it's actually verse 17. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. What is the implication of went off? When is the next time we hear about the dragon as a, a, a named uh, entity? Well, the next verse, 13.1. Yeah, but I mean, after that, when what, what we're going to see, and I'm, just, I'm not going to take a long time on that because it's not our subject for tonight, but, but the devil finds for the next many, many years, the devil tries not to appear openly at all. He hides behind organizations. If he can get some organization or some human being to do his dirty work, that's what he likes to do. So when we talk about the devil going off, he disappears. The next time he comes out openly is all the way down in chapter 17, as we'll, we will see. Well... It's interesting to notice, of course, is Revelation 13, 1 and 4 that I just, uh, I just, we just read um, about the description of the beast. Compare that with Revelation 12, 3 and 4. Another mysterious sight appeared in the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and a crown on each of its heads. With his tail, he dragged a third of the stars out of the sky and threw them down to the earth. Do these two dragons sound or look very familiar? Very similar. Almost the same. Not quite. Some subtle differences. But almost the same. Well, the first time he revealed himself to humans, he came in the form of a reptile too. So yes. he apparently likes to manifest himself in the image of an animal. Yes. Does that mean mindless? Did you have to mention that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's not mindless, he just wants us to think that maybe he is. Well, cunning, too. Cunning. Yeah, cunning. Well, following the downfall of pagan Rome, a number of different invasions of the Roman Empire took place. <laughs> Excuse me. Fred, I think you have yeah, something there. The successive invasions of the Roman Empire by numerous Germanic tribes and the replacement of the empire by a number of separate states or monarchies are well-established facts of history. Owing to the fact that a score of more barbarian tribes invaded the Roman Empire, commentators have compiled <coughs> various lists of the kingdoms that were founded. The following list is representative of some of them. We have the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Vandals, the Suevi, the Alemanni, the Anglo-Saxons, the Heruli, the Lombards, and the Burgundians. Some prefer to list the Huns in place of the Alemanni. However, the Huns disappeared early without leaving a settled kingdom. You find this under F. D. Nichols, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page <laughs> 826. We need to notice that the beast from the sea has features of a leopard, a bear, a lion, as well as a nondescript beast. Do those things sound familiar? From Daniel those 7. All from Daniel 7, 2 through 7. And, in fact, the number of heads, the number of horns, put all those four beasts together, if you can, in one beast, and you've got this beast now in Revelation. 
What is that supposed to teach us? That the glean from philosophies, practices, from these different uh, kingdoms. <laughs> exactly. And prominent in each of those religions, each of those kingdoms, of course, was emphasis of their particular religion. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to worship our God or our image or whatever, or you're out. You, we'll destroy you. I have a theory that the <coughs> lion represents uh, pride, uh, boastful pride of life. Uh, the bear uh, is told to devour much flesh, so the lust of the flesh. The leopard uh, is swiftly over the ground, so he could be the lust of the eyes. Um, so I think there's something more than that, uh, particularly because in Daniel 7 it says, when the, uh, the fourth beast is destroyed, it says, but the others were given life for an appointed yeah. period of time. So it's obviously not talking about uh, Babylonia, where Daniel was. Mm -hmm. There's some symbolic uh, reference that carries all the way to the end. Yeah. And so I, I, I think there may be something in that. And then, of course, we see this uh, as a cl conglomerate here down in, right. exactly. in Daniel 13. Well, we note that this beast in Revelation 13, 5 to 7, is persecuting is a persecuting power for that 1260 days or 42 months or three and a half years. And this organization, which claims to be a Christian church, is in fact the perse persecuting the pure woman who fled to the desert. This phase of prophetic time ended in 1798 when one of his, that is the beast's heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, took place. So what follows that time must be after 1798. And what we are told is that the healing of the deadly wound draws the admiration of the entire world and they worship both the dragon and the beast. And so now I'm going to ask you a question. In what sense are people worshiping the devil in our day? They're doing their own will. Multiple sense. <laughs> and there's... Is that everything you look at? We're getting into more and more confusion mm -hmm. between... In, on many, many levels, political and, and everything, more and more discord. Mm -hmm. okay. said, you, you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. Well, how, when you worship or admire stuff, you probably spend some time with, uh, uh, in that presence of that, whatever it might be, whether it's pop this or popular that or whatever. And unfortunately, many of the popular entertainment media today are, there's hints here and there, well, they call pretty, it American Idol in one of the programs. So, what, yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty frequently, um, so show decided satanic influences. Yep. Well, we have noticed repeatedly that the, the striking parallels between the prophecies of Daniel and those of John. So, and and I'm not going to take time to read these passages. Revel thir Revelation 13, 5 to 8, Daniel 7, 24 and 25, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 to 12. I will tell you in summary, these passages, we notice at least four prominent features. One, Satan will oppose God and blaspheme his name. Two, he will try to place himself above God. Three, he will oppose God's true people and try to change their times and laws. And four, he will deceive everyone except those whose names are written in the book of the Lamb. So, it seems like that would be a pretty important thing to do, have your name written in that book, right? The sea beast activities are often described as blasphemous. What does blasphemous mean? That's not a word we use every day. Anybody want to try one of those? Sorry. Speaking against God, blasphemy, evil. Making the fool of God. Okay, look or at a couple target. of these verses that we have here. John 10, 33. And he replied, we not, do not want to stone you because of any good deeds. This is talking to Jesus. But because of your blasphemy, you are only a man, but you're trying to make yourself God. Right. Does that sound like the beast? Mm -hmm. Trying to make yourself God? Look at Matthew 26, 63. But Jesus kept quiet. Again, the high priest spoke to him. In the name of the living God, I now put you on oath. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. So what's he, and of course, what does he accuse Jesus of doing? 
calling himself God. Blasphemous. And Mark 2, 7, for example, how does he dare to talk like this? This is blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sins. These verses make it very clear that the sea beast is trying to negate Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, replacing it with a human priesthood that claims to administer salvation and forgiveness of sins. So now, we believe the Bible teaches that salvation and the forgiveness of sins happen where? Who's responsible for that? Christ. Jesus himself, exclusively. But now we have groups here on this earth that claim, no, that, that forgiveness can be administered by human beings. Claiming to be able to do the work which only God can do is the essence of blasphemy. Thus, the first part of Revelation 13 describes a time of major apostasy and decline in Christianity. It is a time we call the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. While the first half of Revelation 13 describes the fact that the sea beast receives what appears to be a fatal wound, the second half describes how that wound is healed. A second beast arising, look at the verse there in Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb's horns, and it spoke like a dragon. We've already talked about dragons. Now here's one speaking like a dragon, which is largely responsible for this healing. Compare Revelation 12, 14 to 16. We'll move on. Clearly, this next beast um, arises under very different circumstances and has very different characteristics than the first beast. Remember, the first beast came up out of what? Water. Water, out of the sea. This beast comes up out of? Land. Land. Okay? This beast, the first beast has what? Seven heads and ten horns. This beast has two horns and, and, and looks like a lamb. Very different. Um, this, uh, this beast appears almost harmless at first. It has two horns like a lamb, but later it will speak like a dragon. So once again, we, we compare back to Revelation 12, 4 to 7. He was given the two wings of a large eagle. She was, I'm sorry. The church was given two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert where she will be taken care of for three and a half years, safe from the dragon's attack. And then from his mouth, the dragon poured out a flood of water after the woman so that it would carry her away. But the earth helped the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the water that had come from the dragon's mouth. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants, all those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. So, when we compare that with what we just studied in Revelation 13, we note that this beast arises in a place which formerly provided refuge for the people fleeing from that first beast. This beast arises after the sea beast had received the deadly wound in 1798. And Charles, I think you're going to help me so know who that is. What nation of the New World was in 1798 rising into power? giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the attention of the world. The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation, and only one, meets the specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. This is Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 440, paragraph 2. Okay. So the United States of America arose because Protestants, fleeing from persecution in Europe, established a nation where they demanded freedom of religion and freedom of the press, particularly. Well, so we read then in the next couple of verses there, Revelation 13, 12 and 13, it used the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. How might that manifest itself? The second beast, using the vast authority of the first beast in its presence, forced the earth and all who live on it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. This second beast performed great miracles that made fire come down out of heaven to earth in the sight of everyone. Have we, have we seen that yet? or still, That's still future. We've seen the first one. 
And uh, there was oppression in this world for a long period of time. And the oppression is about to manifest itself once again, which means the same principle that guided the beasts the first time around throughout the Middle Ages, where people were not allowed to think for themselves, will reappear a second time. Well, there's two, a couple of very interesting occasions in Scripture that we already know about, that John knew about where fire has come down out of heaven. Which kind of fire do you think this is? Look at 1 Kings 18, verse 38. The Lord sent fire down and it burned up, the, this is the story of Elijah, burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, scorched the earth and dried up the water in the trench and left a dark hole, you know, a black hole. Is that how the devil is going to come down? Or what about Acts 2, verse 3? Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. So which is it? Or both? Or is it the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> oh, there's another possibility. Or is it the fire that Elijah called down on That's the what we are just talking about. No, oh, oh on the, the one soldiers. later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In Second Kings. <clears throat> so what what was that previous either. text you had there? First uh, Kings 18.38. I think whatever it takes to deceive the people, that's what Satan is going to do. Well, and when it gets to the end, it, it'll, be, it'll be also Satan doing anything he possibly can to try to eliminate God's people from this earth. Sure. That's yeah. the whole idea. Yeah. Well, we see it more and more today that we want morality to be dictated from high places in government and elsewhere, as opposed to individuals gaining the morality of Jesus and spread that morality from person to person as a grass, grassroots movement, as opposed to something that is imposed from, <coughs> from above, which is exactly what's happening today. I guess we don't even have to mention anything. People can figure that out for themselves. Huh? That's right. By the working of apparent miracles, and some will be real miracles, Satan hopes to convince the world that he is God. Gordon? Um, Ellen White, Great Controversy. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. So the lamb-like beast will begin speaking like a dragon, exercising power and similar is exercising power similar to what the sea beast has already done, becoming intolerant to those who do not agree with it. And then we have some more words on that, Gordon. Also from the Great Controversy, Ellen White. Such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution. But the inconsistency of such action is no greater than is represented in the symbol. It is the beast with lamb-like horns, in profession pure, gentle, and harmless, that speaks as a dragon, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Here is clearly presented a form of government in which the legislative power rests with the people, a most striking evidence that the United States is the nation denoted in the prophecy. But what is the image to the beast? And how is it to be performed? How is it to be formed? The image is made of is made by the two-horned beast and is an image to the beast. It is also called an image of the beast. Then to learn what the image is image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. Myra, tell us more. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God and in control, in order to control the consciousness, consciousness Conscience. Yeah, that word. Of the people. She sought to support the secular the support of secular power. 
The result was the papacy, the church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will, be, will have formed an image of the Roman her hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will eventually result. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. Great Controversy, page 442, paragraph 2 to 445, paragraph 2. That's pretty blunt. Yeah. Yeah. Not, we, not a lot of waffle in there. It's happening as we speak Where, now. Yeah. Now, like as the we fog speak, in the pot syndrome. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's just uh, it's it, undercurrent that. Uh, we should not be dealing with trifles, you know, things that matter nothing to our salvation. You know, what the p pots and pans were on the north side or the south side of the burnt offering, and you know, nonsense. Really, truly, it's our salvation and the salvation of mankind. Mm -hmm. See, that's, uh, that's at stake. Finite beings need to learn how evil left to run its own course. Yes. Well, we'll we're, how it will end up. Yes. You aren't trying to suggest that left to our own devices, we would be, end up being evil, are you? That okay. still seems to be. <laughs> you know, you go clear back to, uh, well, we we're familiar with the war in heaven, or at least uh, of what we've been told about it. But go back to... Uh, Genesis uh, 1, what, 5? Or 4, excuse me, 4 with, with Cain. God said, okay, you know, you, Cain stepped out of line. He's not, I don't, I don't uh, uh, Genesis 2, probably. Two. Genesis, two, Genesis not one. 4. No, no, it's Genesis two. 4. Well, Genesis chapter chapter 4. Chapter 4. Chapter anyway, four. I'm getting mixed up four. here. Anyway, but the, he didn't say, uh, kill that guy, so you, the rest of you people learn how, how things are supposed to operate. No, he says, put a mark, don't touch him. Okay? You're going to learn, all people, all finite, intelligent creatures are going to learn about evil. Mm -hmm. Remember in Joshua, was it uh, Judges 2 or 3 there, it also says that they will learn about war. Yeah. The war is, is and three. the war goes on up here. It, it's mm -hmm. ideas that need to be dealt with. So what is the mark of the beast? Well, look at the verses. Revelation 13, 16 and 17. The beast forced all the people small and great. Now this is the second beast, the lamb-like beast, the land beast, are uh, cooperating with the sea beast, with the, using the power of the devil behind both of them, forcing all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark. That is the beast name or the number that stands for the name. Now I I think we really should have started with the previous verse, verse 15, because it specifically says, the second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast, and so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. There's a very clear goal there. Well, we're supposed to compare that with Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 8. Israel, remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Never forget these commands that I'm giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you're at home and when you're away, when you're resting and when you're working. Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on the, your gates. So, what is Satan doing? Counterfeit, counterfeiting God's methods. Right? Well, he's also counterfeiting his word, his message. And when the message is corrupted, who can follow a corrupted message and expect the right decisions to be made? Well, 
And look at, God still uses those same kind of techniques. Look at Revelation 7, verse 3, that we covered a couple weeks ago. The angel said, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, until we mark the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. <clears throat> and that's repeated in chapter 14, verse 1. So this, this seems to indicate that this uh, mark on the forehead, which is a change of a person's mindset, comes from higher places. Mm -hmm. They are imposed on the peop people, which is, goes against God's principle of freedom to decide for yourself where you want to stand. So what do you think it means to have God the Father's name written on your forehead? It means to have his character in our brain, in our his mentality. Ide his ideas yes. working around in our brain. It seems logical that having a mark on the forehead has to do with mental and spiritual complicity, while having it on the hand implies going along with his behavior for convenience. And the final issue will be over who we worship. Now, a lot of people have the idea, well, yeah, you know, some people worship God and some people won't worship God. No, the Bible says that when it comes to the crisis in the end, there's not a question of, Will we worship God or won't we worship God? It'll be which God will we worship? Some will worship the true God and some will worship, the majority will be worshiping the false God. So it's not, okay, worship God or don't worship God. It's which God are you going to worship? Okay, so and I'm watching the clock here. Revelation 14, 12, Revelation 13, 10, and Ezekiel 20, May 20, 12 and 20 make it very clear that the seal is represented by the Sabbath day, those who keep the commandments of God. Thus we see that the mark of the beast involves the substitution of a human commandment for God's commandment. And Jim, I think you have something on that. The mark of the beast is the papal Sabbath. When the decree shall go forth, excuse me, when the decree shall go forth, enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and of his image. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Ellen White, Book Evangelism, pages 234 and 235. So this individual, with his number of 666, is described by Paul as the man of sin, 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Satan and his evil host will do everything they possibly can at the end of this earth's history to bring human beings into their side against the true God. While we may recognize that Sunday keeping will end up being the mark of the beast, it is not true yet. Dennis? No one has yet received the mark of the beast. The testing time has not yet come. There are true Christians in every church not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have the light and have seen the obligation of the fourth commandment. But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Signed, Ellen White. Signs of the Times, November 8, 1899, paragraph 2. And Very good. Also in evangelism. Mm -hmm. We live in a world with massive changes taking place on a daily basis. What kind of things do you see around you that seem to be moving us closer to what we were reading about in Revelation 13? Let's just touch on a few of the many things. One, Multiple organizations are being formed to create cooperation between churches to emphasize their similarity in beliefs and to minimize their differences. The Roman Catholic Church is reaching out in every way it can, can to encourage Protestant churches to come back to the Mother Church. Well, last year, October 31st, 2017, 500th year, uh, more than 100 million folk, mostly uh, World Federation of Lutherans, we made a mistake. Sorry, we're coming back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the Anglicans were even ahead of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So interesting things are happening. Yeah. 
uh, very interesting. Uh, we we wonder how is it going to happen that uh, Sunday worship is going to be enforced throughout the world. It's going to happen. Yeah, it is going to be happen, and it's going to be fairly easy to do that. Uh, you ever heard about New World Order a few years back? <laughs> Still People are still <laughs> talking about it. Well, yes, yes. The United it's, Nations. Yes, the United, it's still a major issue at the United Nations. And Obama right. wants to take that position, secretary. Yeah, yeah. And some of you are aware of the documentation, which is not widely available, but documentation showing that the person who started that New World Order thing at the United Nations claimed right up front a woman that she was being guided by the devil. Wow. Incredible. <laughs> well, Blavatsky? No, uh, well, uh, hold on. Again, say the name Helen again. Helen Blavatsky? He's, that might be. It was a woman. I, I've forgotten her name right well, now. Well, the, the guy that just died here last Friday, and they had a big funeral about him today, he was a, one of the yeah. forces that verbalized yeah. this idea of no world order. Yeah. Uh, I think there was a book also. Oh, either he wrote or someone, thick, thick book, uh, New World Order. and. Well, going on with our list, two, the rights of the First Amendment of the United States of America are being chipped away on a regular basis. You know, uh, the nation that was set up with pr Christian principles were saying, no, the Christians can't possibly have an advantage over it. Atheists should be just as prominent and just as respected and should have just as many rights and in order for, for us to I mean, they're just one group. And in order for us to respect those people, we have to reduce the rights of Christians. Three, Islam is becoming more and more militant and Ill intolerant of Christianity. Do I need to say anything more? Four, people are bringing more and more cases even to the Supreme Court against those who choose to exercise their religious, biblical rights. We know about that. So, in light of all that, how should we relate to ministers and members of other churches? Gary? Our ministers should seek to come near to the ministers of other denominations. Pray for and with these men for whom Christ is interceding. A solemn responsibility is theirs. As Christ's messengers, we should manifest a deep, earnest interest in these shepherds of the flock. It comes from... A Perfect Ministry for Mrs. White, the Australian Union Conference Record, June 1 of 1900, and the Testimonies for the Church. Very good. There are several main themes that need to be noticed here in our historicist interpretation of Revelation 13. So what's the difference between historicist interpretation and other kinds of interpretations? Real quickly. There are some people who think everything in the book of Revelation happened back in John's day. Those are called preterists. There's others who want to put it all still way in the future, and those are called futurists. We believe that God can accurately predict and see the future. And so he, he, he presented to John pictures, snapshots of future events in, from John's day, that, and some of which are still future in our day, that take a historical context, a historical sequence. And we believe that that we need to interpret the book of Revelation in this historical context. Notice that Revelation 13, 1 through 7 and 13, 11, describing the early events of these two beasts are described in past tenses. But when we come to talking about what they were doing in the times of Revelation 13, 8 to 10 and 12 to 18, the tenses are present or future. So even within the passage itself, there's hints that there's some of its past and some of its future. This supports our giving a historical interpretation of these passages. Revelation 13 then focuses on Revelation 12, 13 to 16, and gives us more details. So this sea beast, which is, Satan's acting, which is Satan acting as a counterfeit, Christ, has done everything he can to imitate the example of Jesus, but in a false way. And it's amazing how many counterfeit things the devil are spelled out really here in the book of Revelation. And Fred, I think you've got some of those and you can, yeah, maybe I'm Charles can help us. Yeah, I'm just going to do a few and someone else will continue with them. One of the most prominent features of the book Revelation 
is the presentation of satanic counterfeits that oppose God in a spiritual war of cosmic proportions. The beast introduced in Revelation 13, 1 to 10, is a counterfeit of Christ. Note the following parallels. A. The beast is an image of Satan, whom Satan brought forth, Revelation 13, 1, just as Christ is the exact image of God, begotten by the Father, Psalm 2, 7, Colossians, and Hebrews 1, 3. The beast has seven, has ten corn, horns and Crown. blas... Ten crowns. Ten crowns, I'm sorry. And blasphemous names, while Christ has many crowns and worthy names. The dragon gave the beast his power, throne, and great authority, Revelation 13, 2. Just as Christ has power, Revelation 5, 12, and 13, throne, 3, 21, and authority, 12, 10, from the Father, John 5, 21 to 23. The beast has a seemingly fatal wound from which he has recovered in 13.3. Counterfeiting Christ's resurrec resurrection and the beast's recovery is one of the principal features that attracts followers, Revelation 13.4. Just as the resurrection of Christ is one of the principal points of evangelistic proclamation. Worship is directed both to the dragon and the beast, Revelation chapter 13, 4, just as Christians worship both the Father and the Son, John 5, 23. The beast attracts the worship of the whole world, Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, just as Christ will be worshipped universally. The beast utters blasphemies, Revelation chapter 13, verse 5, while Christ utters the praises of God. Hebrews uh, 2, 12. The beast makes war against the saints, Revelation <coughs> 13, verse 7, while Christ makes war against the beast, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. The songs of praise to the beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, counterfeits the song of God in Exodus 15, 11. The striking juxtaposition of Christ and the beast in Revelation chapter 9, 11 through 21, shows that these are the two main warriors in the battle. Christ is a divine warrior while fulfilling the imagery of Exodus 15:3, Isaiah 59. Um, and the beast is the unholy counterfeit warrior, fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 through 8. Okay, that comes from the Reformation Study Bible, bringing the light of the Reformation to Scripture the New King James Version. And for those of you who would be interested in looking in that material more, more in, in detail, and looking at all the Bible verses, our handouts are available on our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can get this handout for yourself and see all these references and go through and realize the incredible ways. It's just unbelievable how Satan has tried to counterfeit in every possible way, you know, Christ. I mean, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does Satan come up with? Satan, beast. the beast, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. And it, it just goes on and on and on. Amazing what he's done to try to imitate God. Well, it can be confusing when reading scriptures to read about the earth. Sometimes it seems to be an evil place, especially in contrast with heaven. I mean, down here is earth and up there is heaven. So, um, Revelation 9, 1, for example, and Revelation 14, uh, 36, and uh, uh, Revelation, I'm sorry, we're missing a number there. Revelation 8, 13, 13, 8, and 17, 8. On the other hand, when the earth is tr contrasted with the raging sea waters or flooding waters, the earth is a positive symbol. So if you have to choose between being out there in the, water like this and drowning versus being on the solid land, then the earth is a good place. So, um, on the other hand, when the earth is, con uh, I'm sorry, this is primarily in contrast with the sea beast. So, 
Can we positively identify this land beast? There are many reasons to believe that the land beast is referring to the United States of America. We've already read a couple of passages, uh, references about that, but Adventists have consistently identified the United States as the land beast of Revelation 13, 11. I think you can help us with that, Gordon. Um, this is from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 121 and 122. The history of the land beast in the text, Revelation 13, 11, is much shorter than the history of the sea beast suggesting a relatively new arrival on the scene of history. Coming out of the earth recalls the positive actions of the earth in Revelation 12, 16. Hey, what are those, just real quickly? Remember, the woman fled where? The desert. To the desert. In other words, the land, somewhere away from where all the people are, was a safety area for the church. So here we have the earth being a positive influence. Okay, go ahead. A land beast appears in the context of the captivity of the sea beast, Revelation 13.10, which Adventists understand occurred in A.D. 1798. What was that? The That's the uh, birth when, the when Pope the Napoleon sent his general Berthier down to Rome, said, I've had enough nonsense from the church. We're going to silence them permanently. He arrested the Pope, put him in prison, and how long did the Pope last? Not even a year. He was dead in prison within a year. Okay, so that was the end of this 1260-day period, or a day year in prophecy. Uh, Gordon? Number four, unlike the sea beast, whose pedigree recalls the empires of Daniel 7, the land beast's pedigree has no ancient roots. Five, the land beast arises from a different part of the world than the sea beast. Six, in ancient non-biblical mythology, the land beast, or behemoth, lives in an arid desert space far away from people. Seven, the land beast wears no crown, suggesting it has no king and no pope. Instead, it offers political and religious liberty. 8. It speaks like a lamb at first, yield, wielding a gentler, more Christ-like authority. But that gentleness does not last. Number 9. The land beast eventually becomes dragon-like, like the power that attempted to kill baby Jesus. Number 10. The land beast is described in very religious terms, not just political ones. It is the religious side of the United States of America that is especially in focus because faith, what we believe and practice, greatly matters. Wow. So is that enough reasons to identify this second beast, this lamb-like beast as the United States? Pretty compelling evidence, wouldn't you suggest, wouldn't you say? Well. Another interesting parallel here, and we're, we're running out of time, is the story of Revelation 13. Let me just read these few verses quickly. Revelation 13, 14 to 18. And it deceived all the people living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. I'm going to jump over from there. And what are we going to compare that to? Daniel 3. What happened in Daniel 3? Nebuchadnezzar set up a statue, all of gold. He didn't want it to be That's gold and silver and brass and iron. He wanted it to be all of gold. And what did he do? Made everyone bow down. He says he, he called people from all over the world all of his different areas said, come here and worship this, this statue that proves that I'm going to be, my, me and my family are going to rule the world forever. Well, people from all parts of the world are compelled to come to a single place and engage in an act of worship in Daniel 3. There is a death decree proclaimed against anyone who refuses to worship. Both events are associated with the number six. Remember that if you look at the, the original measurements in in um, Daniel 3, it's six cubits wide and 
60 cubits high, right? And the dimensions of the image in, in Revelation 13, the number associated with that beast is 666. Six, six, six. Why do you suppose the number six is involved here? Well, it's the day that man was created, so in Jewish yeah. thought there's an idea of an association there. Okay. There's some meaning to the number six, just as the number seven is kind of uh, perfect and 12 is complete, is, uh, six is evil. Six is evil. Not so much just natural evil, but it, it falls short of being perfect. So it, it, it ends up being evil. But then you got the 666, six, six, so you have a trilogy of evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to make a very quick comment because our time is yeah. short. Um, uh, when the time of trouble comes, our help and our uh, help might come from some of the most unexpected places. Mm -hmm. the, the Protestants perhaps are not our best friends, by the way. They're not going to. We share nothing with them almost, okay? However, however, Islam. I just came from mm -hmm. three weeks of missions. You see, we can go freely speak to them. When I say, look, I'm a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist, as Christians we know who are Adventists, I say, you all believe that Hazrat Isa Salam, Jesus Christ is coming back, so you're all Adventists. And they'll smile, nod their heads. These are professional yeah. people. I says, okay, and the Quran has at least in seven places talks about Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath. Then I go into lifestyle medicine presentations. A day is coming when perhaps these folk are going to say, yes, we know these people. They believe in the God. Yeah. Allah is God. El Shaddai. It's God. Yeah. So you see, that these are our people. These are similar. You see, we share with them 28 messages, 28. Mm -hmm. Okay. They share 20 of those. Protestants yeah. only 13. So we got to yeah. work with this folk. Well, in this lesson, we've been able to talk about one of the most important chapters in the Bible. Chapters that will affect each one of us. It, hopefully in the fairly immediately fu immediate future. Jesus is coming back, folks, and these things we've been studying today will take place before our eyes. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for revealing to us at least these bits of truth that we can put together as building blocks in our future hope, our chances to, to, to see that you are right, that you saw these things in advance, and we can trust you more faithfully, more eternally, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>